It's 10 o'clock. I now declare the general committee meeting open. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet, which is the Kabi Kabi or Gabi Gabi people, to pay respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. We have an apology from the Mayor Tony, who was on a conference call until approximately 10.30. We have no presentations or deputations, and the first item here is referred from the Planning and Environment Committee, which is the Noosa Biosphere Reserve Foundation 2018-19 Annual Report, and as allowed understanding orders, would like to kindly accept a, uh, an offer from representatives from the NBRF to join us as non-members of the meeting to answer any questions that councillors may have. Uh, so uh, Dick and Rex, if you'd like to... Come and join. Mr Chair, I request a, uh, a, a motion that we relax uh, standing orders so that a more candid discussion can be uh, had with the... Uh... Okay. Oh, thank you for the idea, um, Joe, but it's, um, as, a, as a general rule, the general committee is, until it goes into, once a motion is moved and seconded, it's, um, it's, it's more relaxed than an ordinary meeting. Um, oh, I'll like oh, refer my question to see how that, if that's the case, Mr Chair. Well, my, my ruling is that we, it's unnecessary, but please, by all means. So yeah, well, I mean, my understanding is we're in fa fairly formal proceedings, and to have that more or The ruling of the chair is correct. What we'd normally do as general committee is to have questions before the motion is moved and have discussion. Once we get into where the motion is moved, that's when it becomes formal at that stage. Yeah. 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 I'm, 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 I'm happy with that situation. Invite councillors. No need to stand um, during the general committee. It's been the general practice, and there's no need to introduce that, that now. But we will reserve that for the more formal, ordinary meeting. So, welcome, Craig Doolan, Environmental Manager, outgoing chair and now advisor, Mr Dick Barnes, and the current chair of the NBO, Rex Helverson. Welcome. Thank you. Councillors, do you have any questions for... Um, the gentleman about their annual report. I think I do. I've just got to find it. <laughs> well, oh, I, wasn't, I won't stand up as we're not being asked to stand up, but I do have several questions, and one was put in advance on notice to um, Rex and Dick. Um, the first question is because the annual report tends to cover everything from 2014 all the way to 2020. Um, but it doesn't very specifically say what was done in 2018-19. So given that this is an annual report for 2018-19, are you able to tell us what specific activities took place in 2018 and 19? Yes. Am I allowed to respond? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, obviously, we disagree with your, uh, your, your basic tenant, uh, councillor. Um, we try and write a report that is comprehensive, that allows many members that are involved with us to understand what's going on. So the only references to things that aren't done that year are in to support the context of our current uh, uh, activities and anything that we've put in for the future uh, is obviously supported that way too. The other thing we've found that the AGM takes part, with the, obviously the annual report is for the general meet, meeting of the members and that actually um, it takes place three or four months after the, uh, uh, the, the, the formal fiscal year end. Um, and the approach we've taken is, yes, certainly the accounts and the fiscal accounts, the auditors report and so on, are specifically between two dates, but where we need to explain other issues. So, for example, we, we noted in the 1819 timetable that we were going to be seriously short of directors. Um, and just to say that in the, uh, in, in the report just raises the question, well, so what? What have you done? So in order to be much more effective and, and community if we've included in there the activities that then took place to replace the directors and that of course formally needed to go to the AGM anyway so I would like to suggest that anything we've put in there that's of previous years and past years is in there to support the activity statements we've made for this year. Thank you I didn't actually ask that question the question I asked were what specifically were the activities that took place in 2018 and 19? And I'm suggesting I've answered that by saying what has happened in 1819 and supported it by things that were a concept that were important to, to that from the past and things that it leads to into the future. I don't hear an answer. No, no, well, I've just given you the answer. The, the answer, answer is, is the report. It's not in the report. We are, we are, the annual report does not have activities. You are place. not reading into the uh, activities the, the supporting points we make. 
It's all about activities that took place in 1890, 19, but we put around it supporting context. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you made a quote about something that was raised in 2014. And that was a background. I'm not actually making a comment about that now. I'm simply asking but what in happened question. in 2018, 19. It's, uh, just read the report properly. Yeah, I have. So, so there's a point of disagreement there. Mm -hmm. So we'll leave that because okay. I, I guess the periodic review was, was intrinsic to the work done in 1819, a large body of work, and that's in the report. That if you Are you now speaking on behalf of NBRF, I'm Councillor? Answering, I'm answering the question uh -huh. um, uh, as the council's observer, our uh, council's um, representative on uh, NBRF board. Obviously, the periodic review was. Around I'd like to ask a question of the CEO. Yeah. While we understand that Councillor Wilkie, as a mere observer, is um, Actually, exempt from conflict of interest. I do not think that it's appropriate for him to be answering questions on behalf of NBRF, because that goes beyond the um, ex exemption of conflict of interest. Um, no, that's not actually correct. The exemption for conflict of interest relates to if a council has been appointed to another board, um, I'll use tourism nursery or the biosphere as examples. Um, by being appointed, they don't have a conflict of interest. It's not a qualified um, exemption. It's a, an absolute exemption. You don't have a conflict of interest if you've been appointed uh, by council. Actually, the Act says that you, they do not have a conflict of interest for merely being a, an appointment. Mm. But taking other steps isn't merely. Um, so the word merely is the key word there. May I respond to uh, the... Uh, no, no, before, I think there is a need now to refer to standing orders. Um, I just heard a councillor blatantly interrupt the chair of this committee. Um, that is a breach of standing orders and I would like that even though we are in a right situation that that doesn't occur. I, think that I have right. had to ask about conflict of interest and I believe that's in the um, interest of all the community. And it, it has been answered, councillor. Um, and in answer to your question, what activities took place during the 2018-19 year and the the um, former chair, Mr. Barnes, uh, replied saying, you need to read the, that it's in the annual report. And I would suggest that if you're saying no, nothing is in the report that um, re records anything that happened during the 2018-19 year, it is an unfair and inaccurate question because one of the first items it refers to was the periodic review, which is a very large body of work. And for you to say that, that um, there's nothing in there that refers to work done in 2018-19, is either an unfair or disingenuous question. So there was one thing done in that year. That at was, least, Council. At, at least, least one thing was done. You, at, at least. Okay. I do have some further questions, um, which maybe Rex or maybe Dick would like to answer. Most of these refer relate to what's in the funding deed, which was agreed in June, mm -hmm. July 2018. So this financial year, 1819, relates to the new funding deed. The 1920 <coughs> relates to the new. No, the funding deed was agreed in 18. That's 2018. Correct. That's correct. correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, in section 6, 1 and A and B, there's a reference to developing and reviewing a three to five year strategic plan and operational plan. Mm -hmm. There's no mention of that in the annual report, but I just wonder what progress did occur mm -hmm. in relationship to the strategic plan and operational plan. In the, um, in the body of the document, it uh, sets down a, an approach to uh, the big ideas generation that we've, um, we've been asked to take on. And it shows how a process will be it will evolve from some basic research about what are the big ideas to how can they be implemented and put into paper. And so that's an ongoing process. We started that. There are, uh, as I say, there are seven or eight um, big idea things which have been actioned in in uh, in this year in 1819. So that's another six or seven activities that, plus the fact that we comment in the thing about what projects have been completed in the year and so on. So there's a lot of stuff in there, to be frank, about the company. About activities. the strategic plan and the operational plan? No, about, plan? The, about the, the plan in general. And I've made the point that we've put down a methodology for the st strategic plan and we're working on it. Okay, thank you. Just a subsequent mm -hmm. question. Would it be fair to say that the, the work coming out of the, of the new strategic direction and planning uh, is represented from um, item six, new ways of working in the annual report? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So another one in um, six, section 6.1c, it refers to improving the NBRF governance model. And I just wondered whether in 2018, 19, any steps were taken to improve the governance model? Yes. 
The, um, clearly, we've, re we've reinforced uh, the, the governance in, in a number of steps. Firstly, um, we actually agreed to, during the year, to increase the number of directors. Um, and the idea being then that directors can take responsibility for specific areas of our, of our work. And bear in mind that everybody's a volunteer, so that's, uh, that leverages our, our resources. So in terms of pure governance and so on, um, we've expended, part of that is to expand the resources that we have available. Um, the other side of that is we found it very useful to create the role of advisor. So where we've got a specific expert or expertise that will be very useful to us, um, and I see that all as part of good governance, uh, that we've uh, asked various people to join us. And um, the best example so far has been John Stocker. He's a past uh, uh, chief scientist for Australia. He's a past chairman of uh, CSIRO and so on, uh, and very experienced guy. Um, the other thing that we have on the board now, which was appointed during the year, uh, Diana Lane, um, she has uh, uh, some specialty qualifications in governance uh, as part of the uh, Australian Institute of Company Directors programs, of which many of us have uh, been party to. So I think there's a lot going on in governance. And uh, again, we have uh, seen as part of our governance to be out there and say think more about what we are doing. And that's been part of the communication program. Um, the other question relating to section 6.1D, um, it relates to establishing and reviewing, maintaining guidelines, assessment criteria and funding processes. So has there been any progress on that 2018-19? I think it's, f it's fair to say that we, uh, uh, we are you know, settling down with the new ways of working with the big ideas and so on, um, and uh, how that leads to that in the future. We have identified, I think, that we've uh, always concentrated more on the uh, running the projects. So our, even our leverage measurement is uh, the cash input from us into the project. And we're looking for uh, a situation where we do $100 worth of work that gets us a project of, of, of sorry, of contribution, which gets us a, pro a project of 300. And so that leverage is we, we, we've worked hard on. One of the sides of that, I think, which we said we want to improve that's coming out of that is a better way of evaluating the actual effect of our projects. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, it's very much a let's have these objectives and let's be clear how much it's going to cost, but we need to close that loop. And uh, as you're probably aware, there's a lot of work going on in, uh, in general about the benefits of environmental activities and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess linked with what you just talked about, also in the funding deed, um, there is a um, KPI relating to yeah. fundraising as a tax yeah. tax deductible gift recipients yeah. status and we do understand that the leveraging of one to three is not the tax deductible gift recipient part so have you made any progress the uh, I don't think that's uh, quite the case in the sense that uh, the, uh, the gift recipient status is an issue for the donor and it's to give them uh, tax benefits not to give us tax benefits so already for example the Thomas Foundation has, uh, has given money into projects through that route um, and as such we, uh, it's something we need to develop. But it is an area we've, um, I think we've, we've unfairly not, not mentioned how much cash we've actually attracted uh, into the organisation through projects and that's where roughly speaking of the three to one, one is, is the, uh, uh, the MBRF contribution, one is cash from other sources and that's quite significant and the other one is in kind and that from other sources. Mm. And I think that um, that needs to be understood in our in our funding agreement. We're also finding that um, the um, the big um, funders um, actually have ideas of what they would like done. It's not a question of writing a project and going to say, would you fund this? Would you fund that? They actually already have things they're interested in, and that's where we we were hoping to uh, develop with the yeah. Um Another issue that had arisen in the past was the relationship between. NBRF and the Noosa Community Biosphere Association, which was originally intended to be the voice of the community vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the Biosphere Foundation. Has there been any in, um, improvement in the relationship of the NBRF and NCBA, and is there any more opportunity for a voice from the community? The, um, uh, the issue there is, obviously, I, I, as, you, as you well know, I've been actively involved in both sides, having been the first uh, president of uh, NCBA. Um, NCBA itself, as, you, as you're well aware, went through a terrible time of uh, personality clashes um, and uh, increasingly a dominant role of one or two individuals at the expense of the others. And so it really fell apart. 
I'm very pleased to say that uh, one of the guys, John News, has picked that up. He is um, very energetic. He's a bit kin kin obsessed. So anything, <laughs> any, yeah, any, any, anything. Yeah, he, he, he actually he actually made some quotes which I won't I'm repeat. Sort of just maybe focused rather than obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if I can touch on that, um, I'm in conversation with John and trying to get a more pro productive and, and bigger vision role yeah. with just what you're referring to in mind, being that voice for the community. Say that again. I'm sorry. I said that I'm, I'm, work, I'm talking directly with John and yeah. looking to establish exactly what you were describing, a better voice for the community and better coordination between the two groups to that end. Thank you, Rex. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and I guess linked with that, I also have a question. Has any consideration been given to reviewing the constitution of NBRF to enable residents greater access to the ranks of membership? Um, well, the short answer to that is no. Um, but we have obviously taken a lot of steps to open up for recruitment and so on to allow people to come into um, the MBRF board. We are uh, particularly aware of the need to improve the gender balance on the board and we are finding that it, um, uh, an advert, uh, advert in the paper or a uh, advert in the Australian Institute of Company Directors just doesn't appeal um, very well. And we're hoping that um, we can build through advisors relationships with, with um, a, a fuller range of, of gender which can, can help with that. If I can add to that as well, um, one of the things we're trying to do is, is, well, you may have noticed we have a new website, so we're doing a better job of outward communication. We will be putting the reports, in fact, I think we're already doing that, um, it's at least in process, so the final outcomes will be available. But we've also, wherever we've identified people that are very passionate in the community, such as the Glossy Blacks, for example, we have invited them to come and present and meet with us so that we are getting that direct input into projects that we might be looking at. Um, and further, we're, we've done things like go to the Rise to Meet the Tide and put a booth up and meet with the community and identify what we're doing and hear from them what they, they want us to know. And okay. Just as a further question um, about uh, allowing more residents to be involved, allowing residents to be involved. Um, it's an expertise-based board, exactly. of people with good qualifications. But what proportion of them are residents of Noosa? All of them. All of them are residents of Noosa. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I actually asked about membership, not about directors. Yeah. Um, the uh, um, on, on terms of MBRF, you realise the membership is. All directors and past directors. Yes, I understand. That's all. There's yeah. no other opportunity for. And the opportunity, as you quite rightly said, was to was yeah. meant to be NCBA doing its job. Yeah. 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 Follow up question. question. That's it. So uh, Councillor Jackson was quite right at the time. The last okay. term of council, there was a oh. role. Sorry, if that's you, you go first. It is. Uh, very follow up from the conversation. Right, sorry, 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 Councillor Jackson. Sorry. Um, yeah, there was a role that was uh, notably. Um, it would be played by the Community Advisory Association, which, when they became a community group and set their own constitution, moved a little bit away from that. Um, since then, that both NBRF and the Community Advisory Association, in, together with every other NRM and environmental community group, have been participating in forums and been out of the environment roundtable. Um, I know NCBA, the last time I asked, were very keen to see that as that coordinating umbrella role. Is NBRF still? Team uh, participate in that sort of uh, bottom-up process to to get that guidance that was initially envisioned back when we set up. Short answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I again, John has introduced me to that initiative, and I have not yet begun to participate, but absolutely interested in doing so. So there is a, there is a survey being done through Phil Moran and Liam here asking all the participants how they see that progressing, and one of the opportunities is to progress into a into that role that was perceived more fully in the yes. Yes. Sorry, Jess, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to rehash just quickly about what I spoke about. This was up for peri periodic review uh, this time around, wasn't it? The 10-year mm -hmm. uh, hash. Like, I had it written down somewhere, I can't find it. There's actually quite a few advisories around the world that didn't get their 10 years back across Absolutely. the line. That's yeah. correct. Uh, I just want to know on the, like a sliding scale exactly there's a Were we kind of at like the nine end? Are we kind of at the 4.5 end? Five being the milestone? Or was there a sort of some yeah. sort of engagement? Because, you know, there's all this the, uh, man in the biosphere talk yeah. and we all know it's a little yeah. bit, as Rex and I spoke about the other day, it's 
can be quite not tangible here in Noosa sometimes, yeah. man living and working in the biosphere and so forth, but just for argument's sake, we're at the nine or at the four? Yeah, I think uh, we were very much at the nine. Um, the, there were very complimentary uh, messages back. In fact, there were no criticisms as mm. such. Um, the, uh, some of the ones that lost their status um, uh, were, they were very, very well behind on the timetable. Um, and the, another issue has happened, which is um, in the rush to create biospheres in the early days, many uh, things that we would regard as national parks uh, were put in as biosphere sites. And they do not have the human population within them to really be a man in a biosphere operation. So I think the, the number of Australian ones has dropped from 14 to 9. Yes. Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I think four of those are basically um, because they were national parks rather than... And there, yeah, some of them are questionable. And you touch on something, it's a very unique thing. There's not a lot of places in Australia, not a lot of places around the world that are man and biosphere designate. Yeah. And how special that is. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've done a good enough job yet of communicating why mm -hmm. that matters to people. Yeah. Can and I just quickly... Can I just add to that, that answer? The letter that came back through the... or comes from UNESCO in Paris back to Canberra, back to the Council, the letter from... Um, that we received the Canberra for people observed that they hadn't seen that too often, where it's been commented that the quality of the application. Yeah. Normally, the Paris um, designation is you know you're renewed or you're not renewed. They actually complimented um, Noosa on the quality of its application, yeah. the quality of its renewal. Uh, just on that, running that question, my colleague Stockwell commented a long few little while ago about the biosphere that's envisioned to the south of our border, mm -hmm. uh, and I read a few of the other biospheres around the world's reports over the last few weeks and we're pretty unique having the Sandy Straits and them. Do you foresee sometime in the near future we'll look at sort of some strategic sort of framework or form about engaging mm. and Council Stockwell Board, I can't remember what he said exactly a while ago about how it was, you know, close <coughs> <central. laughs> You never shut up, do you? One of the, um, one of the major difficulties that some of the uh, biospheres have had is um, reporting to multiple councils and multiple local groups um, and uh, that's caused a lot of trouble uh, where maybe they have um, in the original in the original construction of um, the Sandy Straits Bundaberg was going to be in it um, but then they pulled out at the last minute so that even Bundaberg is not in the Sandy Straits thing which it should be uh, and I think the argument is uh, there are some pretty unique things about us the Sandy Straits and the um, uh, and the Sunshine Coast yeah. area, which you probably would lose if you sort of rolled it all together, which yeah. I think is what you're answering. All right, that's all for me. Uh, having said that, sorry if I may, <laughs> um, that's not to stop close collaboration going on. We had a really good Australian Biosphere Conference, yeah. learned a lot of things, um, and uh, just because we're all so busy doing our day-to-day -day work, we don't spend enough time coordinating. And that was hosted by the neighbouring. Mm. Yeah, well, to put it to put it bluntly, like it'd be great to collaborate with all three and start yeah. returning a, some do, but Benjamin Franklin on the table. Could only get some dollars, so if you yeah. know all three would work better than split between two, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know, it's just. I think as long as it doesn't conflict with the. Yeah, obviously, but as you yeah. said, it was three very different elements of the yeah. biosphere, and there's no reason why those things you know can't. We're, we're obviously the. What's the word? Mac Daddy or the new Marino one, and they, can, <laughs> they can hand drop off, and we can start benefiting financially out of this. So, yes. uh, CEO has something to yeah. add to this form question. Brought up a letter from UNESCO that actually highlighted that they talked about the um, commended the National and Noosa Biosphere Reserve Authority for their effort in the preparation of this high quality, high quality periodic review report, and that's what the Canberra bureaucrats said they don't when we see that in any responses from UNESCO. Mm, cool. Yeah. Councillor Jay, you've been very patient. I've just, Kylie, just observing on the screen behind you, have we lost them? Um, video. Video? The sound seems to be continuing. Um, yeah, gentlemen, look, I, I thank you for a very comprehensive report, but I'm inclined to agree with Councillor Jackson on, on elements of this. Uh, whilst it's lovely to see the overall project investment and value, what's missing for mine is the expense on each of the projects for the year. Just gone, and maybe even a uh, a bit of a breakdown of the project, stating when it began, what the expenditure has been e each year, and when the when the completion is is expected, exactly. so that we know how far through the project we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I do think there's an element lacking uh, in some of the reporting with 
a bit more specific detail about what actually occurred this year whilst uh, the embodiment of the entire project is uh, is good to understand the, the, the full parameter. I think uh, some specific detail about the, the actions yep. undertaken within that project within the, the financial year just gone and, and to justify the expense that's gone into that project through that financial year is uh, is uh, is lacking. That would be uh, that would be my uh, yeah, we'll take, we'll yeah. take my read of it. I said, and I, I do hope you, you take that on board. So you know, it's great to turn around and see that the, uh, for example, the the first project there, which uh, uh, take it the, the, the keep it in Kinkin, which is a multi-year project, for example. Um, whilst one hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars worth of spending, two hundred forty-six cash in kind, project value of four hundred. Where's it at? Specific, specifically, when did it begin and when did it finish? I mean, it, for, a, for a read of anybody outside of yeah. the inner circle that knows and understands the project, I don't think that's captured within. So okay. that's uh, that's my critique. I mean, overall, I'm encouraged and, uh, and overwhelmed by the progress and the, and, the, and the projects that are being undertaken by NBRF. I think uh, they're all good value projects and I do uh, appreciate and encourage the type of um, uh, uh, projects that NBRF have been uh, progressing in this time, but I do think there is a lack of detail on on a year by year basis. Okay. Uh, in the report that uh, the average person reading would uh, would be able to put into what you've actually achieved this year. Can I ask Councillor Drusser a question? So the audited financial statements that were an attachment to the report, which give a breakdown of all the money spent on the individual projects, that was I did not re- sufficient. There was I'm, an attachment to the report. Separate to the annual report. I've gone through detailed. that. And I didn't. I didn't see the breakdown project it's, by project it's council. Not project by project. It, it, it doesn't have project by project council, and that's why I back the fish. One hundred and thirty-five. Where's that? This is on the last page of the audited financial statements. This is actually a um, is is the management account. The very last yeah, page. That's right. And that um, that is not explained. If if people are interested. Okay. Again, it gets it, okay. Yeah. It gets captured in a financial report, but. Yeah. I think it could also get captured. I in think that, there's a very fine point there, in yeah. that annual report. Yeah. I think yeah. I think yeah. those specific details, and yes. you know, even yeah. a, again, the project commenced this year. This is year four. Year yeah. four, it's due to finish mm. in year five. Whatever it is, I think. Mm. Uh, I, I, I take um, Councillor Jackson's comments as uh, as as a reasonable and fair comment for a, for a person outside the sphere reading okay. it for the first time would be going. Yes. Well, I don't see how much they've spent this year, and I don't see what they what what specifically has occurred within those this year. Justifying one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars in uh, bringing back the fish may, you know, whilst our projects at this stage, this is what's you know, and and the and the lead up to it, uh, uh, a little more outline said I, I, I think is uh, would be beneficial and, uh, okay. and give a greater clarity within the report. That's that's my reading of the report. I was going to and, say, and my, and my comment. I'm sorry. I, I wanted to say I take both of your points that I think it could be more easily read. You have to dig into it, and there is some. Right, I think you have to go into the financial detail of yeah. a, and yeah. in your report to see what was spent on each project. I think it's fair comment, and I think in in terms of two things: one, the next report, which will be the one that I'm writing, will will have more attention to that. Um, the second, would you like something like that done now as an appendix to this, in terms of this is what happened with these projects? In that time frame. You mean in 2018-19? Yes. I think that would be helpful. Okay. And there may have been other things outside of projects that were done. So, yeah. Between now and Thursday, right? No, 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 I don't think so. I'll deliver Christmas Eve no, to you. No, no, yeah. Not by Thursday night, by Christmas no. night. No. <laughs> well, I think, I, think it's a, I, I think the points, you know, I think the points have been made, and I, I've, I've asked you and your board to take those, those comments on board and think about the way mm. you, uh, you make that presentation. I do have one more question, yes, actually. Um, on pages, um, oh, on pages seventeen to twenty, there are some new big ideas that have been identified. I guess that's been through that process that you've been talking about. Um, and I'm just wondering what the next steps are with those projects, and will NBRF be helping proponents of those projects seek funding, um, not only from council but elsewhere? Mm-hmm. I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done that at all yet so far? The, um, the best example we've got, I think, is the, um, the Schools and Education Hub, the Environmental Education Hub, where we've um, put in some money to start that concept going. Um, if I could just step back one moment. We spent, uh, spent a small amount of money in the previous grant round with the Sunshine Coast Primary School, uh, Sunshine Beach Primary School, um, and it developed into a terrific outdoor classroom um, outdoor learning centre and so on. Um, and it, we looked at how that could be extended with the proponents of that. 
um, and realized that actually trying to do that in every school was just going to take too long and so on. And the opportunity came up with some help from Councillor Stockwell to use some of the premises at the Scout premises, uh, which are available. Um, and the concept is to establish an environmental education hub uh, where schools can come. Uh, the, uh, uh, and it's being very, very enthusiastically received. It's, it's marvellous to watch the kids do the, uh, do the work in that way. Um, and um, basically we put some money into that. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, proponents are putting in quite a lot of in-kind money. But there's a grant that the um, uh, government has now to provide $102 each year um, for outdoor activities of this sort per, per student. And that is seen as the, the route to ongoing success and, and so on. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I don't believe it's uh, even a perceived conflict of interest for this item, but as it was mentioned, I can just clarify that my uh, linkage and association with the Ministry of Environmental Education Hub is in my role as group leader for Mr. Seascape. Oh, cool. Not yeah. as a council of Mr. Shah. Sorry. We didn't, in the report, I think we, we didn't make enough of. Um, the, uh, the management accounts we use, which are much e more easy to understand, um, and uh, they are the last page in the financials, but they actually, and I have a few slides, if you wanted a better explanation of that, or we can circulate that, that shows how that breaks it down. I've read those and they're very clear. Yeah. Okay, good. good. There's only one last comment, I'd like to congratulate you on finding your niche. <laughs> I think you know it's been a, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges as to where the uh, Biosphere Reserve Foundation um, fits in the overall picture with uh, regard to uh, funding and funding opportunities and the like and, where, uh, uh, and what goes and the projects that are being brought forward I think is a credit to you and uh, uh, ongoing success for the future. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would like to move a, um, the recommendation uh, that was in the planning and environment agenda with one small addition. <coughs> And that addition at the end is, and thanks to Mr. Dick Barnes <laughs> for his efforts in his role as an expert in the Zurich Foundation. I'll second that, seconded by Councillor Jerusalem. So, councillors, I think the. Um, we just won't wait for tonight. Okay. We're going to have a formal debate, you guys. Can't say. Can I just say, can can I just say one quick thing? For his efforts, for his efforts as in the new spy series of the Foundation. In his role as chairman? Oh, before he's chairman. Okay. <laughs> Happy to see him. Oh, Mr. Chair. You don't need to stand. Mr. Chair, yeah. um, if we are now moving into motions and debate, I think last year there was some confusion because uh, Mr. Barnes stayed at the table, but I think at this point, if we're moving into debate, it's more appropriate for. Yes. The new advisor of people to step down. No, well, do the, it's it's worth clarifying that now that we're moving to formal debate. Okay. You'll be uh, your presence here is welcome to answer questions, but you're not to enter into the debate. Those are the rules. May I make one yeah. last last comment and to thank uh, the council and the councillors for the support I've had in in doing the job. We um, we came into this in some quite difficult situations, and it's been very very supportive and. It's been a great uh, sounding board to have those conversations with, so I, I thank you for the support. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Thank you. Right, okay. Uh, Move second to Councillor Jurisidic. Councillor Stockwell. I do. So, yes, thank you for the report. I think there is one thing in there that um, is the greatest value of the Nessa Biosphere Reserve Foundation that can't be costed, and that's the skills, expertise, and time of the directors and the past directors. The, the level of skill. Uh, the experience that comes into that organisation is, is, is immense. Like I've had the pleasure of sitting on a couple of the um, interview panels for uh, intakes of directors, and it, you're always blown away by the sort of people that are in this community and are willing to volunteer to support uh, the worthy initiative of the, of, uh, the management of the Biosphere Reserve Foundation. I, I do understand that 1819 was a transition year. We did change. Uh, the funding agreement with council and we did really refine the role of what council was looking for in terms of its investment in the new Biosphere Reserve Foundation. I think one of the problems was early in the piece people um, thought that the NBRF was everything about the biosphere, it was a big body that did everything in relation to the management of the biosphere and that's not the case. It's got a very specific role as, as in the articles of its incorporation in the foundation and also in its agreement with council what we expect out of it. Um, I think the management of the biosphere comes down to 
a very broad council community and industry partnership and that's what I think will have the potential to grow into the future. And I think the role of NBRF into pushing new ideas, into looking at the science that's going to lead us into new understandings is really important aspect of that. And I think that's important. Uh, I did note that concept of collaboration and I do <coughs> believe uh, that the area below the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland is particularly poorly served by both the state and federal government. I do believe if, um, if I'm sitting in this chair in April next year that I will be looking at engaging in that collaboration here, I think, and with the community, because it is something that has really gone off the boil, and that's investment from other levels of government into the management of our environment, into the management of our biosphere, if it is not related to reef water quality and it's something we shouldn't actually tolerate as a community. Um, I finish with um, acknowledging uh, that uh, you know, Vic came here like many people to retire <laughs> and instead became a very critical part of not just NBRF but Noosa Landcare, previously of NCBA, um, and uh, you know, one of the founding members of Country Noosa. Um, Vic has stood down as chair of NBRF, and I think, as he said, um, it was in a bit of a, uh, a hiatus at the time he took over, and I think the steps we're seeing uh, going forward has put it in, once again, to put, put the ship right. Um, I know that it would be silly for me to say to Dick, enjoy your retirement, because he, uh, he's actually gone on to uh, go back to being a farmer again. Um, but I do thank him and his, his team of, of directors and past directors and their advisors for all the hard work they did over the financial year in 2018-19 and wish you well for next year. Thank you, Councillor Stockler. Do other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Yes, I shall speak. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, one thing I'd like to start with is to thank um, NBIF for delivering your annual report in such a timely fashion. I think that in the past we've been waiting a lot longer, so I appreciate um, it's come before Christmas, and, and that's, that's terrific. Um, I have an extensive experience with annual reports in private sector and government corporations, as well as um, in volunteer associations, and even in council. So my concern about it not having details about what really happened in the year of that financial re annual report uh, are valid because that's um, something I'm used to seeing in annual reports. Anyway, we've, we've talked enough about that. Um, our um, NBRF continues to receive operational funding, though not grant funding, um, which has to be competed for um, with other people who are seeking environment grants or community grants. But nevertheless, um, Council has, in 2018, funded uh, NBRF for 140000 and in this financial year, 2019-20, 420000 for the operations. So it is still of a great interest to residents and ratepayers to see what NBRF is doing. And of course, the biosphere belongs to everyone. And so again, it's of great interest to everyone. Some of the issues that I raised right from the start um, have been only partially addressed. Um, NBRF, and of course, this was handed over to people at the table. Now, as a fait accompli, the constitution is set up as a closed shop with members only being current and past directors. So the community does not ha get a chance to join or vote. And, and there's no process really in place to get input from the general community. Usually it goes just to community groups. And we know those can end up just not really being totally representative. But I, d I have appreciated what I've heard Rex talk about, that that progress will continue in reaching out to the community. And, and I'd be very keen to, to see that kind of input. Um, NBRF um, also um, has um, demonstrated the three to one um, leveraging, and that is that proponents bring not only a proposal to get grants, but generally they come along with proposals that also have in-kind contributions and cash contributions from elsewhere as part of the bundle. Uh, so I think that that's a positive, and I appreciate that. I might note that council's own community grants tend to leverage 10 to 1. Uh, so it's not, they also require in kind and cash contributions from uh, proponents. 
So it's not as if three to one was, you know, the the only um, achievement. I mean, there, our own community grants in council ten to one. Um, the foundation was originally very much set up on the basis of getting tax off getting tax deductible gift recipient status for NBIF so that it could attract donations and it's been a disappointment over the past five years that in fact that has not really been highly um, actualized though granted of course the proponents have brought with them the the um, extra funding which is is terrific um, I guess council will be um, receiving further um, applications in the coming year from NBRF for further operational funding and, and perhaps for grant funding. Um, I'm keen to see what um, is proposed um, and I continue to look for improvements in governance, conflict of interests being avoided and funds still um, being further raised and looking for funds outside of just council. Um, I, I, I support um, council's motion to note the NBRF annual report and I certainly wish uh, Dick Barnes well with uh, uh, an exciting future as a farmer, Brett Barnes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Joe. Um, I have got a further question uh, for uh, the members of the table. Um, the Community Association. I see little mention of it in in the report. And I'm wondering how the relationship between the Community Association and the, uh, the board is going and what, uh, what the current status of the uh, Community Association is, if the board in fact knows. What the yeah, I, obviously we uh, do our best to stay in touch with the uh, NCBA. I mean, technically, as you're aware, we have very independent constitutions um, and we're not um, we're supposed to treat uh, NCBA like any other uh, community group and so on um, as I mentioned they have gone through some very difficult people processes I guess that's not unusual in uh, not-for-profit community groups um, and we've done our best to stay in contact with them and, um, and to, to help when they ask ask for our help so for example they have put up a proposition to fund the biosphere Biofest, which we have supported um, and we've done in a couple of years. So we're trying to help them rebuild and we're trying to help with the uh, uh, with, with what they do. A second question, if I may. Um, within the community, in kind of support within the projects that you are undertaking, has there been an op opportunity for NCBA members to be involved in those activities or and, and, and an active reach out to NCBA to be engaged with that? And I think the, the big best example of that is the Biofest. Bio it's, it's that's not one of the projects, though, Dick. That's, I'm just referring to the project specifically as okay. opposed to as opposed to an initiative of theirs. No. To keep it in Ken Ken. There, yeah. there. So you answer. Um, John, in particular, John News is very involved in the Keep It in Ken Ken and Keep On Keep It in Ken Ken project. So there are potentials, um, but that also relies on them broadening their vision of what they they want to do and can do uh, outside of the Kinkin -Kin region. I think some of your question might be best directed to them directly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just, yeah, just want to see what the relationship status was and, uh, and, 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 and how, how engaged the NCBA members were within the, uh, the projects that were being, being made. Um, I will talk to the, uh, the motion now. Uh, I've got, I, I concur with uh, <coughs> some of the comments of, uh, of Councillor Jackson there, but uh, in, uh, the Biosphere Reserve Foundation is not the only uh, uh, community entity receiving operational funding from Council, but it is crucial that the community can see value for money for that operational funding. So therefore, uh, I agree that there's a, uh, uh, the oversight is, uh, is uh, 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 an important element of making sure that, uh, that fund, those funds are being well spent and that we're getting good value for money. From what I've seen in the report, there is good value for money, although as, as we've stated, I think there's elements of the report that could be could be enhanced for, for public reading. As I said, there's a number of other community groups that would relish this support, so uh, it's 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 a privilege to, uh, to be here. It would be interesting to see, uh, Councillor Jackson alluded to the tax deductible status and ability to attract external funds from uh, recipients. It would be good to, uh, to get an update and a report on how well that's progressing at some stage and understand the challenges 
and all successes that you've actually had in uh, in, in attracting that. I know I note that the projects seem to come with uh, with an element of funding, but what are the um, uh, what are the uh, successes that you've had? Which is one of the things that uh, was uh, in the constitution of setting up the, uh, uh, the the fund of try to you know to to attract those external uh, external funds. I'm glad to see the projects pro pro uh, pro progressing well. Thank you. Excuse me. Put my teeth in. Progressing well, and I said I'm uh, uh, delighted to see some of the successes and some of the projects you've been bringing forward. I think they will be uh, proven to be a great value to our community over the years. And uh, I thank you and uh, and your uh, directors for their, their knowledge. I'm overwhelmed by. Uh, I think Council Stockwell alluded to that the. The successes that you're having are now starting to draw the right type of people uh, with the right type of experiences towards this, which was, a, I think, been a challenge in the past. And I think that's a that's a credit to the successes that you're having. And I wish you continued and further success in the future with a new chair and uh, and some new board members. Congratulations. Thank you, Councillor Jerusalem. Uh, I'd like to speak now, and I think it's it's worth starting by um, saying that perhaps more could be done to communicate that every single community group in the Shire have constitutions that require new members to be um, approved by a committee. Um, they gives them the ability to select residents from the community that best suit the skill set that they're after. And uh, the MBRF board is no different in that regard. They're an expertise-based board and members are recruited through a publicly advertised process which is very well subscribed to and uh, they get the pick of the best, some of the best and the brightest people in the Shire who are willing to volunteer their time and expertise to making Noosa a better place to live. Um, as I said, um, uh, so it's a, an open adver advertisement process, um, uh, open to meeting with delegations from the community, and they're continually improving on their governance. As part of their uh, new strategic plan, the vision, NUSA is living proof environmental protection inspires healthy and prosperous communities. And their mission statement, as also contained in the annual report, is working together on big ideas, research, piloting, fundraising, advocacy and action, and that's exactly what they've been doing. Although this volunteer board's work focuses on long-term projects that will transform NUSA's environment and prosperity, thanks to the project-based partnerships with community groups, universities and NUSA Council created by NBRF, Noosa Shire has already seen improvements in its natural environment and created several research-based action plans towards greater prosperity and a healthier environment. As a result of the university-backed trial, the world's foremost cons conservation group, the Nature Conservancy, is investing $1.2 million in extending oyster reefs throughout the Noosa River. We know that despite being valued extremely highly by Australians, waterway and ocean health is suffering as a result of human impact. MBRF's work to reverse this decline of waterways and oceans through the water, sorry, this work to reverse the decline of waterways and oceans through the water filtering and habitat provided by oyster reefs has been proven to improve water clarity and increase marine biodiversity. Noosa's oyster reefs will form part of a national and global network of reef, reef restoration work <coughs> being done by the Nature Conservancy, and it's good to see this work in a global, a global broader context. As part of its river focus work, the MBRF funded report by research scientist Greg Skilleter has given this community a sobering insight into the scope and nature of the decline in the marine microorganisms that lie at the base of the food chain and are critical to healthy marine ecosystems. An executive summary from this is intended to give regulators and community groups guidance on the ways to reverse this trend. And as we know from the South East Queensland Healthy Waterways report, sediment is one of the main threats to river health and water quality. The MBRF's Keep It In Kin Kin project and the ongoing Keep On Keeping It In Kin Kin project <laughs> use seven years of satellite imaging data to quantify and identify exactly where 2.3 million cubic metres of sediment have been lost from the Kin Kin catchment and through partnerships with land care and hinterland property owners has seen the degraded areas continue to be restored through replanting, refencing and other on the ground rehabilitation work. The Noosa Cultural Learning Trial is an ongoing Cabby Cabby Red project to create a range of materials that will support Indigenous-led cultural tourism and engender a broader understanding of and reverence for Noosa's landscape. This work is expected to be finalised in early 2020. The university-led Koala Forever project has provided community groups and regulators with more extensive on-the-ground data about where Noosa koalas actually exist in the Shire. DNA-based information about their breeding and resilience, 
the corridors via which they move across the Shire and the feed trees they favour. This sort of data was needed to add to the citizen science material readily available as given a more complete and accurate picture of this beloved iconic animal's distribution and habits, which will provide a solid foundation for any action plans formulated to help ensure their population remains viable. A prosperous and productive hinterland is also a widely shared aspiration, and the Rural Enterprise Plan was an ambitious, is an ambitious and enormous body of work that provides data enabling individual property owners to understand what sort of enterprises, be it livestock or cropping, that best suits the soil type and topography of their land and pathways to market for their produce. We cannot underestimate the value of this work to hinterland property owners who often struggle to make a viable living from their land. Ensuring rural lands are viable and kept for rural production is one way to ensure they are not converted through commercial pressure over time into subdivisions, as has happened on the Gold Coast hinterland. The Noosa Trail Master Plan, a partnership between MBRF, Tourism Noosa Land Care and Noosa Council, is also nearing completion. It involves an ambitious audit of the existing trail networks used for mountain biking, hiking, trail running and horse riding. It provides strategies and actions towards it becoming a world-class experience for residents and visitors. Increasing the opportunities for nature-based tourism lies at the heart of the Noosa Trail Master Plan and uh, it provides an inspiring blueprint towards greater prosperity for the hinterland communities. The Roadmap to 100% Renewable Energy is another ambitious project which quantified and qualified the Shire's energy use and detailed a path forward to achieve a zero emission future. The report also highlight, highlighted that alto, al although rooftop solar has seen a significant increase in ownership in the private housing sector to 35%, it continues to rise. The business sector was lagging at 4.7%. NBRF has helped Zen create an action plan has seen Noosa businesses convert to solar power and reap the economic savings that not only make for a more prosperous and successful enterprise, but be part of the broader global transition to and major investment in cleaner, renewable technology that is well underway. The Pandanus project involved a survey of 4,200 Pandanus plants along the Noosa Shire Coastal Zone and Noosa National Park and revealed low and decreasing population numbers and heavy infestations in high profile areas. The timely work found Pandanus in high profile areas in Hastings Street, Noosa Main Beach and Perigian were heavily affected by leafhopper outbreaks. Infection rates at Main Beach were found to have skyrocketed from zero trees in 2016 to 22 in 2018. Direct intervention and treatment as a result of this project saved those trees. The project also involved workshops with Queensland Parks and Wildlife staff, community bush care groups and has led to a further Noosa Council funded project. MBRF is exploring ways to fund instructional videos to also become freely available to community groups, private property owners and government agencies about caring for this iconic species. Looking ahead, MBRF has already facilitated a <coughs> workshop involving key advocates and scientists working to preserve koalas as well as representatives from regional local governments to create a prospectus of actions and projects that need to be funded from various sources. Similar work is being undertaken with the lo local glossy black cockatoo advocates to identify what are the gaps in the research and what work is needed to best help ensure the health of these populations. The NBRF's investment in these invaluable projects has attracted cash and income contributions at a ratio of three to one. And the question is how do you put a price on a future based on a healthy environment and a prosperity that demonstrates how we depend upon it? You can't, it's beyond measure and dollars are an insufficient way to measure it, although oversight is always needed with public money. The projects demonstrate exactly the sort of long-term, positively transformative, science-backed work that needs to be done worldwide to reverse the decline of ecosystems and economies due to decades of unsustainable or unmindful practices. It's exactly the sort of direction we owe to our younger direct generations and exactly the sort of work our younger people are demanding we do. Indeed, they're telling us to either fix the decline or get out of the way so those who want to be part of the solution can get on with it. Unfortunately, we live in a place where the majority agree with them. It's a privilege to have been involved and watch the work of the MBRF's board as the council appointee. Uh, thank you for your work and um, I think the community owes you a bit of thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Stockley, I will. Um, 
And thank you, Councillor Wilkie, for that. It really helps to sit back and look at what the real impact of these endeavours are. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that, as I said earlier, that the Noosa, bit, the, the, the Noosa IFC Reserve Foundation is responsible for managing the affairs of the foundation. There is a much larger cast, 53,000 of us, who are responsible for managing the biosphere reserve. And in that light, general community input shouldn't be to the foundation. It's a misunderstanding of the governance structure in place. The general community input in 2018-19 came through the ability to uh, influence council's environment and sustainability and living policy and environment strategy, to influence council's cultural and heritage plan in previous years, to look at the transport policy and strategy, the local economic plan, um, the social plan, yeah, even for a segue to the next one, the, the ability uh, of council and the tourism industry to work on implementing a sustainable destination plan. The management of the biosphere takes all aspects of our community, whether it's people interested in heritage, whether it's people interested in the environment, whether it's people interested in how to convert the nature and the understanding of contemporary management for sustainability into a tourism product. And that's really important to understand, is the NDRF is responsible for managing the foundation. The foundation does excellent work and has a defined role which will help move the rest of the biosphere in the right direction, or the rest of the management of the biosphere in the right direction. So, thank you, Dick, for your fine efforts. Welcome, Rex. Um, I know there might be a link to Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news with keeping, keeping on keeping it in Kinkin, they've taken the K. So by way of a closing statement, I think we should play around with Blinky Bill in the biosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Stock. Well, <laughs> all right, um, put the motion those in favour. Against, motion's carried unanimously. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Dick. 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 Councillors, we also have another annual report and funding agreement extension to consider. And, um, um, standing orders, the chairman also has the, the capacity to invite non-members to the table to answer any questions that uh, councillors may have about the annual report. And to that end, I, it's my pleasure to invite um, Chairman of the Tourism Minister, Drew Pearson, and CEO, Melanie Anderson, to the table. Councillor, just while you're making your way up, we're having a, a few little... Uh, Technical hiccups with our live streaming today. The um, the software has decided today is a really good day to do an update, so it's working at the moment. We're just trying to get the updates delayed because it, often it shuts down automatically to update the software. And for some reason, it's decided today is a really good day to do that. So we've got our IT people working. Like doing it's that. Work. Isn't it supposed to do that at two o'clock in the morning when <laughs> nobody's actually here? Yeah, that's it is, right. but it's working at the moment. But it might go off, update, then restart again. Just give you a heads up if that happens. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Councillors. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting us to uh, attend this morning and to present. Um, We've got what? A point, but I think it's been put up. Just loading a PowerPoint. We, we will. Um, Councillors, with your indulgence, um, Drew and Melanie would like to show a short presentation. How cool that points together. Thank you. Tourism news. Yeah. So, if I may, I'll just um, start the process, um, look at an overview of where we are and um, what we're here to achieve today, and then I'll invite Melanie, our CEO, to go through some of the specific initiatives that Tourism News is involved in, what we've been doing and what we will be continuing to do into the future. Um, the funding agreement that we've been operating under commenced in July 2017 and runs for a three-year term. And during that three-year term, there are certain obligations on Tourism Noosa 
to provide various services and to attend to the provisions of that agreement. We have, as Council will be aware, implemented our strategic plan. The strategic plan goes from 2017 to 2022 and we're well into that five-year process. Um, Tourism Noosa also delivers an annual business plan to Council each year. Um, prior to, uh, to March, so that Council is fully au fait with what our plans are for the forthcoming year, and we present to Council in that regard, um, and we've done so in each year of our um, funding agreement thus far. Uh, Tourism Noosa also deliver to Council every six months, February and August of each year, a, a, an update of what we've been doing um, our financial performance so that Council is fully aware of the conduct of Tourism Nusa. Uh, <coughs> and furthermore, we present an annual business plan, the plan being presented in, October, in uh, November each year, and uh, in November just past, we again presented our annual business plan, which has been accepted by Council. So, Tourism Noosa has, during the course of the funding agreement, complied with all of the essential requirements of the, uh, of the funding agreement. And so the purposes of our uh, appearance before you today is not only to answer questions and to explain where we're going, but also to seek your um, approval for the exercise of our two-year option. The plan not only has a three-year term that expires in on the 30th of June 2020, it provides for a two-year exercise option period from that date, and it further envisages that the parties will come together at the conclusion of that option period and to negotiate a further review uh, with an, an intention of another two-year term. So, the intent of the funding agreement has longevity and its purpose, no doubt, given that the parties comply with its intention, um, is to give Tourism Noosa and its projects the certainty that it needs to continue with the work that it, that it does from year to year. Before I ask Melanie to talk about specifics I'd, I'd like to address Tourism Moose's position as a destination management body. The strategic plan that we entered into in 2017 specifically pointed out our desire to operate as a strategic destination management body and it recognises that we have not only a marketing bias, but we have a social, economic, environmental and cultural responsibility to work within this community in all aspects of the community's needs in relation to the tourism industry that we are charged with the responsibility of administering. It's a holistic approach. The strategic plan reflects that. 